The Biophilic Leadership Summit is the only multi-day conference entirely dedicated to biophilic projects, principles, and research, bringing together the top industry leaders in an intimate, natural setting to network, build partnerships, and learn from each other. This year's summit will explore biophilic placemaking and how we can use biophilic principles to promote health, happiness, and vitality in public spaces. In addition to fascinating presentations, delicious farm-to-table meals at Serenby, and cocktails, this year's summer will feature a selection of biophilic experiences like forest bathing, bird watching, and more. So join us in Serenby for the 6th Annual Biophilic Leadership Summit from March 24th to March 26, 2024. Learn more about the summit and register today at biophilicsummit.com. That's biophilicsummit.com. We hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Monica Olson. And I'm Jennifer Walsh. And you're listening to the Biophilic Solutions Podcast, where every other week we sit down with experts and thought leaders across industries in order to explore the innate connection between humans and nature and why we need nature to thrive. We truly believe that in order to tackle the global environmental problems we're facing, we as humans must reconnect to the natural world and come to a better understanding of how we fit in and how we are so interconnected. So in every episode, we'll interview new guests that help us uncover and highlight nature-based solutions to get us on a path to greater health, tackling climate change, and ultimately getting outside and connecting with nature. So let's get to today's episode. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Monica. Jennifer, have I ever told you that something Katrina and I talked about and think would be really cool is a database that takes all the guesswork out of building a green home? It would be a whole depository for information on certification requirements, different types of insulation, and all the pros and cons of using certain materials versus others. Okay. No, you haven't, but I really love that idea. Well, I mean, the idea behind it is having a tool to simplify the process that can become you know, really complicated and confusing when you're trying to research all on your own. Yeah, and I think generally speaking, that's a type of issue that keeps people from taking more decisive action for their environment, right? I mean, it's complicated and overwhelming, and it's easy just to have a default to just be the status quo. So to that point, we have an amazing guest today, Dr. Tawanda Green, who is an adjunct instructor at the School of Architecture at Virginia Tech. Before getting her PhD, Dr. Green was a practicing architect for over 20 years, working mostly in commercial and government buildings because she has a background in military, which really informs her design work. She's recently retired, and now she's focused full-time on teaching. She is a massive proponent of human-centered biophilic design and has seen how easy it is to sweep those things under the rug when budgets are tight. Absolutely. We first met Tawanda this past spring at the Biophilic Leadership Summit, and we basically fell in love with her. She is so funny and so smart, and you can just tell that she's an incredible teacher. Yep. So in this conversation, we chat with Tawanda about building out that database for research and resources, why architects should learn basic human biology, and teaching the next generation of science-minded and data-driven architects. So let's get to our conversation with Tawanda Green. Tawanda, so good to see you again. Thank you for joining us today. How are you? Sensational. Oh, we love hearing sensational. So Tawanda, you're not with us. Where are you today? You had just had a glorious vacation, travel vacation in Italy, and you're back because you recently retired. So I want to know everything that leads up to the retirement. So like on Monopoly, I got out of jail. <laughs> I, I made it. I am exceptionally happy about finishing a career, but understanding that everything comes with its challenges and that when we have a, a long career of doing something, we recognize what the good things are and the bad things and thank God for all of it because it's a part of the growth process. I have been an architect forever. And as my grandmother says, I've been an architect since I was in eighth grade and decided that I would get into the government and also do some commercial work as well. So I've got a long history of being in, running my own firm, then going into the government, then getting out of the government, then going back in the government. So <laughs> I, I kind of went through that for a little while and decided to finish my government time. And now I'm going back to my private work again and excited about that. Very excited because this is a great time to be a part of the huge transition that architecture is going through. 
Well, we talked to you and we spoke to you at the Biofit. Well, we met you at the Biofit Leadership Summit. Monica and I couldn't stop talking about your talk and how much we just loved listening to you because you're such passion for what you do and what you've done. Can you tell us like how you led up to getting your PhD? You were in the military before that, correct? Yes, I was okay. in the military through college and then got out of the military after I had my wonderful, beautiful children and decided that I would get into an architecture that was a little bit different. So probably around 2000, early 2000s, this incredible new idea about brain science came out and an architect was leading that charge. And I thought, oh my goodness, what's going on here? This is awesome. And I decided I was going to start following that. And I remember I still have the original architect AIA brochure that says, John Eberhard is leading an effort to connect brain science and architecture. And I have not let go since then. As a part of the process of going through my career, I've seen a lot of different spaces around the world. And I recognize directly because of my longevity in these places, how those spaces affect people. And I can say how those spaces affect me as well. So I am boots on the ground with my comrades working and living in these spaces, or should I say working? Yeah. And living because I spent some time full time in the military. So I started making those connections right around 2000. Well, and I think one of the cool things I remember you saying is your brain is your client, which I thought was like, yes, wonderful. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yes. So that's a big part of how I introduce my students in my class to the concept of, so what's human centric design? I mean, architects have always been building for humans. Yes, we have, but now we're lucky to understand exactly how the brain is the true client and understand how the body is connected to the brain and that the environment that we are creating has a direct, a direct connection to how we feel every single day day after day, month after month, and year after year. I kind of uh, make sure they understand. It's, it's kind of like trying to explain a house from a piece of paper, from a brochure. You have to have that knowledge of how to communicate with people so that you can explain that you are not just a person who sees with your eyes and then you go through your life and nothing affects you. You have to educate them on you're a 360 degree immersive body in the environment and everything affects you. Everything, air, smells, prior perception, hearing, all of that creates your experience in the space. Oh, I love that you just said that, Tawanda, because you're right. I feel like for so long, and the fact that you were tinies together, even in 2000, that we really so much siloed ourselves into these places of just coldness, that we aren't living beings in an environment that could either feed us or deplete us. And the fact that every place should feed us and not deplete us, but we just, I'm always like, we're just separate from. But I love the fact that you've been doing this for so long and saying there are reasons why we feel the way we do in these certain spaces that make us feel tingly and good and warm. And it's like right. the human centric design is what you've always been so strongly afoot about. Yes. And that's why I continued to go to school. And I, through my career, went back at my master's, went back at my dissertation. And it was important that I was able to directly link it to science. And I could make a very strong business case for why this works. Because it's a part of educating people first about who they are as beings in the world, that they're not just this mind that walks through life, but this whole entire being. And then also connecting to the real business case of why this makes sense financially, mentally, physically for everyone in the space. Yeah, we talk a lot about that, that sometimes or many times everybody needs these metrics and unfortunately dollars are one of those metrics they need. And so if we can connect that human health or worker efficiency or mental health to the space of the built environment, you know, a lot of times people get on board Absolutely. a little bit quicker for better or worse. And so I think it's important to think about that because we need the research. We need that efficacy yes. in order to have more projects and have what you're doing be a model versus just like some idea 
in the corner here. You've retired from the government, and I know you're going back to private practice. Are you still going to be teaching? Oh, absolutely. That is a strong passion of mine, yes. Great. Yeah. Good, good, good. So in the future, I plan to be more involved academically with high schools, elementary schools, kind of give back to the community so that it's not just me teaching architecture students. It's me teaching the younger generations and giving them exposure to it. It's interesting to ask the question to my students, when were you first exposed to architecture? A lot of them were not exposed into a very late age. So going back and saying, hey, architecture is this great thing. And now we have this more of combined collaborative opportunity to do very specific things in architecture that don't just pitch you into, okay, you just do drafting. Because of course, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Architecture is so much more. And we've got some great opportunities to grab hold of some young folks who could do some great things. Well, and I think as a woman and as a Black woman, you also have a phenomenal role to play to show that it's possible. I was just doing my Yes, ma'am. You're um, absolutely right. Right. My niece, who's 11, really wants to be an architect. So I just bought her a book about a woman. I don't know. There's an architect out of California called Julia Morgan. She was at the turn of the century. And so she was one of really the first female architects. And so she was really just surrounded by men. And so I bought her like the kid version of like, who was Julia Morgan? I love that. Right. But I guess modeling is so important because if kids don't see people that look like them, then they don't think maybe they can do it. And so, you know, I applaud you for giving back to the younger generation, not just to college students who are kind of already on their path. It's so important to expose kids. Exactly. And to be a part of the equation as well. So it's important that women were involved in architecture. Now it's important that Black women indigenous women, all kinds of different communities and cultures are a part of this resolution that is quickly becoming evident that we can create these spaces. So make sure we're in the equation. Make sure we're there at the table. Yeah, we need the voices. We need everyone's voices because everyone, well, that's it. We need to know, like, once we speak to ourselves over and over again, we're in these silos again. We're not learning about where we all come from and how we're all part of this fabric known as humanness and how do we create those spaces for human flourishing for all, not just one type of person, which I think is extremely, extremely important. And the fact that you're reaching out to the younger people, are there certain parameters when you pick a new project? Like how do you pick your projects that you're working on? Every project is a project for me, no matter where it is, whether it's a gas station or a childcare center or an office. I do a lot of office work. So every opportunity is a really great opportunity to capture biophilia in the space where, of course, we spend a lot of our time. And of course, that is changing. But at the same time, this project of integrating biophilia in the design process is important. It's exceptionally difficult for me from the perspective of the government worker who is trying to apply something that's new. Even if you're a regular, or should I say commercial or professional architect, and you're trying to introduce this idea, it's a bit difficult. I would say it's a little more difficult in the government because they have a set of rules and standards that they adhere to. And it's exceptionally difficult to turn that submarine. So (laughs) we continue to do good things. And please don't get me wrong. There are some fantastic people out there in the government who have made some huge strides, but it's a big government. You know, there's so many different divisions and organizations. And I've got some real heroes. Judith Harewagon is my hero Mm. in the government. So she really inspires me to keep going. She inspires me. Tell us a little bit about, well, I have two questions, but I want to talk about some of the project examples that you feel like you were able to push the military. Tell us about some of those examples, because you worked on a ton of not only new built, but office renovations, which I think is something that we don't talk about a lot. People are obviously fascinated by new builds with all sorts of fancy 
new innovations, but there's so many buildings that need to be retrofitted that can really help the climate problem. And so let's talk about that for a minute. Tell me some about the renovations and sort of what you see as the opportunity there, because there's buildings all over the country that need to be retrofitted. So you make a very good point about existing buildings, especially when it comes to government and um, our spaces. So examples would be just a very basic, uninteresting building or office renovation. This group is getting bigger. We need 10 more desks. So there's an opportunity to get in. And I say, well, have you thought about the space differently where you can add some biophilic elements? And let me tell you about biophilia. This is what it does. This is how it helps you. This is how it creates a space that's supportive. And I'll always make it very cost effective. It's always about paint first silk plants versus natural plants, which there's a maintenance tell associated with live plants. But just to get in on the ground, get some silk plants in there. Also, one of my other favorites is murals on the wall. It's a cost-effective opportunity to create a simulated window because our brains do associate very similar feelings from a mural as well as a real window. One of my other favorites is I love to switch out the lenses in the two by four ceilings and put clouds in them. So it looks like you have a skylight and those type of spaces where windows are very uncommon. And that's not an unusual thing all over the world. We've got lots of spaces, offices, conference rooms where people work with no windows with biophilia being cut off dramatically because of course that dynamic and diffused light is not being experienced. And that's a, big plus when it comes to biophilia, dynamic and diffuse light, understanding how your body changes over time with the different levels of light. And the hormones secretions are different based on the light. So when you're not getting that, you're really in an egg crate as far as I'm concerned. So <laughs> those, are the type of, those are the type of things that I always throw out as opportunities to start including biophilia in the design process. Am I successful most of the time? Honestly, no, because most folks are interested in the bottom line. Is it extra? It's $500 extra. Well, we don't, you know, the budget is and we need it yesterday and ordering things and asking for something that's a one-off. Those are complications that people don't want to have to deal with. They understand they really like it, but Sometimes the priority is just not there. Well, and it's interesting to think about with all of the certifications in buildings, where it's almost a standard practice at this point. If you're building a new building, it has to be LEED certified in some form. And so much of that has elements that are healthy elements. And now we're seeing new certifications kind of coming out, the well and the living building. So you kind of hope that with that business push, the finance people kind of come together that sort of the HR, maybe marketing or the CEO is sort of really starting to push on that CFO position that like, hey, this is good business actually, but it takes all of us in these conversations and spreading the word beyond the metrics that we know the research comes in. Have you been able to see some successful buildings in the military that they're then able to say, hey, this was a good example and we can roll it out. Like, what does that take in the military? Is that like, I have no idea the structure, a general, like who, who, who's the stakeholder there that's going to be, we got to make this happen. I would say just government in general, not so much just the military, but government in general. So those stakeholders, and I, and I'm glad that you asked or mentioned that leadership has to be involved. When we are building new buildings, we often or we go to architectural engineering firms who have this knowledge. And if we're not seeking that out, it's something that they'll bring to us. And if it's something we can integrate into the project and meet the budget at the same time, that's great. Now, the real push, in my opinion, is our need to change policy. Now, we have government executive orders that require us to do lead there are no government executive orders that require us to do well. This ah, is where the change okay. is going to happen. Interesting. That's very interesting. So how so, long has that policy been in place? 
to, oh, to require the had, is that set 10 oh, years or at least 10 years yeah i would I, forgive me for for not knowing this but no not at all it's been been around for a good while i believe that the next step is definitely to get into the well because of course we're figuring it out as we go along we don't know everything and you know it wasn't until the 70s that the mri came out that gave us a picture to look onto the human living brain and what we're actually experiencing based on what we're seeing and what we're feeling so as we were making these steps we attempt to get in there and say okay Let's change this policy. For me, on my level, the best effort that I can do is I can change the design standards in my organization. I say, right. okay, this is what we're finding out in science. This is what's being based on real hard evidence. Let's start making these design changes in our organization. And as we're starting to do that more in each of our government organizations, the executive orders start to make sense to say, okay, let's just make this a government-wide requirement. So this sort of takes me back to my, because again, it's about education and awareness, right? And then obviously research models, efficacy metrics. And so this kind of goes back to your talk at the Leadership Summit, what is really, and, and we were curious, like teaching biophilic design, and you were on like a phenomenal panel with Ellen Bassett and Robin Paddock, who are incredible part of different education groups here. So what is the future of biophilic curriculum? Because I think that's probably what we should be calling it, right? And how does that get integrated into architecture? I don't know, industrial design. I don't know right. quite what the areas are. What's the future there? Tell us a little bit about your thoughts and maybe some of the conversations that came up in the talk. So I understand how difficult it is for any institution government or academic to change. This is still new academic wise. So there are other universities that are teaching user experience. They are teaching human centered design, but to my knowledge, none of it's required. None of it's a part of the, in order to graduate as an architect, you need to have this in your curriculum. So it's a very self propelled desire to move into these areas. It needs to become a basis of graduation so that you understand how humans work. And that's why I am so passionate about teaching my students because they are fifth year students. They're working on their thesis and they are about to get out into the world and start practicing. So when they leave, they can take this with them. But of course, in order for this to be required, I need evidence. I need data. I need evidence-based design projects to be developed. And that's why it's so important that they understand when you go to work and do your first project, baseline the project. At the end of the project, test it against the information that you first gathered, whatever that is. We have to teach our architects of the future to be science-minded, to be data-driven, to understand the huge consequence of gathering this data, keeping it in a place where all this data goes so that we can pull it and explain code-wise. This is important because we've got this information. Then we go to executive order-wise. This is important because we have all this information. And, and universities are, are going to see that, hey, we need to probably change our curriculum, but we can't do it without the data. We have to have a very methodical process of collecting this data and moving forward. And speaking to that, would you think or would you want to see the future of these, these young people to also be studying the brain as well as architecture? Do you think that's like, because I know all your work's in cognition and the brain, and I, I'm so in love with studying the brain and brain health. Yes, So yes, I'm, absolutely. I would think... Yeah, right. So that's a part that's a part of my course. I teach them basic biology. Did you know that you had a brain? Did you know that you see from the back of your head? Did you know that your body is connected through a system of stress versus calm that you have to have a homeostasis between that? Did you understand that your eyes are seeing different levels of light and that your hormones are informed by that? All of that information, and of course, in a very basic manner, is being taught in my course, 
But if we don't understand how we function, how do we know how to build for another person? So that is a part of the brain science and the basic biology and getting a better sense of that. There is an incredible opportunity for us as a community of scientists and data analysts and environmental psychologists and architects and interior designers to be more collaborative in our process of design where we can build some incredible things. That's why I'm so happy. I'm happy I, I'm alive <laughs> right now. I'm going to be a part of this revolution. <laughs> I, I'm so excited. When we first got on the call or whatever, this broadcast, you said that, that you were just like, I am happy to be alive. I can't wait for the next thing. Tell me what's going on. Because I know yeah. we're talking sort of around your history and background, but like, is there anything specific besides that insane oatmeal you made this morning? Like, what <laughs> is it? That, <laughs> what's next? I mean, Jen and I geek out every day on, yeah, pretty much. you know, how to expand the conversation in biophilia, but but you're on the ground doing it. So what's happening? What are you working on right now? Okay, so I am working on the processes that architects use today. Myself and my very close collaborative partner, who is a software engineer, we're working on how do we collect data specifically on the science data that's out there. So there's a gazillion pieces of information related to biophilia, to brain science, to psychological sciences, and its correlation to the built environment. How do I collect that information? How do I categorize it? And how do I use that information to make sound, solid design decisions? So you're thinking, well, you can read a whole lot of literature, Tawanda, and you would never have enough yes. time to cover <laughs> even a portion of it. So we're working together to develop a system and an engine that pulls that information together for us and allows wow. us to easily parse through and collect the information, use the information in a matrix, in a project management matrix that nice. ties the 3 million pieces of information that an architect needs to build a building in collaboration with the other 7,000 people into one place. So it's important that AI is a part of that because AI is that tool that allows us to get things done way faster than we could ever do it. That tool is going to become like the mini me to Wanda who's sure. out there reading all this research, collecting it, organizing it, and then saying, so, you know, I found this research today and it says that there's some new literature out and there's new data on yada, yada, yada. Let's talk about it. So when you're designing a, I'm actually working on a dentist office. And of course you're thinking about the stress of going to the dentist. You're thinking about the smells that you smell when you get in a dentist office, the visual of all of these things. And then you're thinking about the sound of the drill and all of that <laughs> is yeah. incredible in your experience to the dentist. And if you can mitigate that, you've got a huge opportunity to reduce the stress and just turn around that experience. Some of the offices I've been to have been successful in doing that, but for the most part, we, I don't think enough of us are doing that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our dentist here at CRMB, I just went and had a cavity filled. And so I was very close <laughs> to me when you say this. I'm like uh, feeling the cortisone levels. But when you're sitting in the chair, it's this glorious, huge window that's looking out to the trees. And so that helped right. me. And even though, because I was trying to think through exactly that, I was like, I really don't want to hear the drilling. You're not feeling it. I'm like, but they have to talk to you while, you know, so I'm like, could I have headphones? Yeah. Could there be a movie on? Like when my kids were little, they went to the dentist, they got to watch Nemo. I'm, I'm like, I would like some sex in the city, please. You know? <laughs> yeah, I so, don't mind it, right. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's a really interesting everyday example and bringing it down to what we can all relate to versus these like huge class A buildings that I'm like, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. But that is like how kind of like as a consumer, how can we demand better experiences? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
your work too. I'm because c- again, I'm all over the place because there's so much I want to talk to you. And there, I know we have got limited time, but I'm also fascinated about your residential work too. So I haven't done a, much residential recently. I did a lot when I had my firm when I was younger, a small child, of course. I'm, I'm only 21. <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> I, I, we are. I, feel, I swear, I swear, I still feel very, very young. Most of my residential was before I got into biophilia, but it's something that's very easily translatable. I find that biophilia is just really not given enough credit for every single location. Everything from the waiting area in the car rental space to the area where you're picking up your groceries in the front of the grocery store. So everything has its points where we can really identify what are the pain points here at this spot. For example, I like to use picking up children at school with with, with my classroom. So we were talking about an example of how do you integrate biophilia in a space where you know people are a little bit stressed because it's like, where's my child? Will you come out of the school? What about this person who's taking too long in front of me? What if it's raining? I need to get to work. So biophilia needs to be a part of all of these opportunities. And I think just to make the case, our everyday experiences where we're dealing with spaces and environments where we get pretty stressed, where the trees, the water, the lighting can make an immense change for, I should I say, an immense change across the world, but little small increments of change in each person. I just love that. It, it's kind of like back to your, that dynamic and infused light and the hormone secretions. Like I had never heard that. I think that's a really interesting, like making the connections for, if you will, everyday people, I think is so key. Because again, you know, not only from the leadership down, but from the bottom up, we can help make these changes. So Tell me a little bit, because I'm sort of fascinated by the idea of, you know, that there would be a tool to help an engine that you could search to. Because I know working at a place that we build houses here, and I'm not on that operation side, but I have people asking me all the time about different products. And obviously, we do a ton of sustainability things in the built environment. We follow a lot of different certifications, but you could always do more. And there's new stuff coming out all the time, right? Whether that's different types right. of cement or these like timber built buildings or even just what goes in the wall, uh, the uh, insulation. The, Thank you. Acoustic. The insulation it can, can be changed, right? <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. insulation, right? So so right now, spray foam has been the standard for a tight house, for a well house is a spray foam. But my understanding is that when you do install it, you still, well, one, it's a petroleum-based product, right? So it, it's a fossil fuel-based product. And then when you're installing it, I believe you still have to have all the masks and the respirators, I think. And so there's been a push to go to cellulose, or I was reading something about denim can go in there. And so where are we on those type of examples? Like, Because I would love to be able to send somebody who's building to buy a new house, or if I'm doing a renovation and I want to do an addition, how can I build it in a smarter way? You know, these are very, not very exciting it's not the marble that I'm putting in my kitchen or my fancy stove or my refrigerator. You know, these are kind of boring things that are behind the walls, but they're super important for not only planetary health, but for the health of the people living in it. Okay, I'll stop talking. But like, I would love it if I could point somebody to a tool. There are a couple of different separate tools that allow that. The important thing is that the person who is leading the project, whether it be the architect or the interior designer who maybe is doing an interior renovation, they are your expert in the field. So for example, I just returned from Neocon in Chicago. That is the ultimate when it comes to anything interiors. So you have to be well knowledge in this area. Now, Will I be able to collect all the information that happened in the conference? There were a billion places to go. So the use of a tool to pull down information, to gather data or or to gather vendor information, as well as scientific data, as well as case studies, being able to do those things and properly bringing that information together 
and organizing it so that you can make sense of it is where the tool is, is that we're developing. So that's so cool. It's something that is just all over the place right now because we have all these resources. And then, of course, you go to the architect who knows because that's all they study and that's all that they've researched and that's their specialty. But then that architect only has a small portion of what's happening around the country in terms of products sure. and, and new things that just came out, as well as things that we need to stop using because, as she quite eloquently explained, we have to think about our environment more. So that tool is going to be a exceptional use for staying on top of things, not picking or using the last thing we've always used because it's, it's still in stock and no one's raised the red flag and say, stop using it. We need to be proactive. That's the word. We need to really be proactive about what we're selecting. That's great. I like. Yeah, I remember that. you even That's talking great. about that when you were speaking at the summit I was really interested in like you were saying, like we're all a part of this. It's not just one person. So collectively, how do we educate? How do we get into places where I always go back to like growing up in the Bronx and I'm thankful that my parents took me out to the Bronx Zoo and botanical gardens and things like that, because the environment that I grew up in is very different than what I know about now. So like, how do we teach people in different areas of the world, the impact of light, of living structures, if you will, and fresh air that I never thought about as a kid. Right. I think that is so important. And that's why I love biophilia so much because it reconnects us. It's a very basic thing that we evolved from nature that we are no longer connected to at a sufficient level that we can start to bring back into our spaces because that starts to train us. That's that exposure that says, you know, maybe I need to be outside when I'm seeing more plants, because if you're used to being in an egg crate, you're going to go work in an egg crate, you're going to sleep in an egg crate, <laughs> yes. you have dinner in an egg crate, because that's <laughs> what you're used to. So let's, yeah. let's, let's give you something different. Oh my gosh. Okay, wait, I have to say that now that you just said that, I think that's so funny, because I feel like the world is opening up to this awareness. But at the same time, like, all the articles, all the stories, everything's about immersive experiences in retail, immersive experiences in home. Right. It's what we've been doing our entire lives that we've become so separate that now they have to call it something, an immersive experience. It's called life. It's a call like uh, how we how right. we shop. Like you just said, like, how do we feel when we go shopping? How do we feel when we go into this home? How do we feel when we go into this hotel? And everything now has to have a name of an immersive experience. Right. It's just so, <laughs> I find it so comical to me because I think, that's how I've always thought in my brain, like, how do I feel somewhere? It's uh -huh. not separate from, but I love that you just talked about because it's always like, how do we educate people that it's, we're all living beings. Like, it's just. Yes, we are. I think we're really stoic, almost to a fault, because I've been interviewing some customers, clients for a project, and they're so humble. They're like, I really don't like this, and I don't like that, and I wish we could do this, but it's okay. Oh, I'll manage. Oh. I'll manage. And I'm my heart is just sinking. I'm thinking to myself, I need to be your voice. You should not have to go to work every day and deal with this and this and this and then be a trooper and say, Don't worry about it. It's okay, I'll manage. Because I explain to her saying the body keeps record of everything. Every time you feel bad every time you feel good. And if you're having continual experiences of, oh, it's all right, I'll deal with it. It's, I don't want to say anything. It's okay, I'll get the job done and I'll, I'll have to deal with all this noise in my office space. Or if you continually do that year after year, your body's keeping check and it's going to materialize as something that's not so good. The problem is, is that we don't see that until years later. So I'm standing up, you know, I'm just like, I got my cape on. Let's go. I'm, I'm here to <laughs> save these people. I'm ready. I'm so you got ready. your biophilic said, cape on, Tawanda. That's right. My green <laughs> biophilic cape. Because I'm Tawanda Green. Ah, <laughs> that's a great point. I love that's a great it. point. I love that. So, so this brings up like such a great point. And I think both of you are kind of giving me these little epiphany moments that it's so obvious. But like, you know, why did we get so complacent? I think that's an interesting, the, you know, humility or the stoicism. 
but we're complacent. And when we get taken out of our every day, if you will, and that could be a walk on the beach or into nature or just a really fabulous experience, whether that, you know, to your point, Jen, like it's a one of these wild, immersive IMAX, Van Gogh-y kind of things, or just an, we, we talk about awe experiences. Then I believe, right, because I'm, I'm you know, such an optimist and full of hope, that it completely changes you and you're going to want to seek out more of those experiences or it can kind of jolt you totally. out of that complacency. But we need to jolt society out of their complacency don't get me wrong. There's a million things we could talk about, but we'll stick to the built environment. <laughs> you know. But you're right. It's like, why is it okay? There's no windows. Why is it okay? There's no plants. Why is it okay? There's no fresh air. Why is it okay? To your point, I, I do I just the dapple, like all three of us, you know, if somebody could see. I us, wish we could all see Tawanda's face have, right now. We all have Tawanda's face. Yes. But we all have <laughs> natural light coming into the spaces that we're in. And that makes the space even for somebody looking at it, more pleasant. So I love that you're asking these questions and I am in on the journey with you and want to do everything I can to help. I will ship your capes out. Oh, okay, yay. Good, good, <laughs> good, good. Yes, please, thank you. <laughs> yes, please, and thank you, Tawanda. <laughs> oh my gosh, my pleasure. Wrapping up, you know, it sounds like this integrating architecture and technology is happening for you, looking at the private practice, and I'm assuming still at Virginia Tech doing the work. Yes. So is there a book in your future, maybe? Oh, absolutely. I feel like there's a book Okay, good. Oh, working on it. Absolutely. And the whole reason I started on that journey with the book is because there's not one out there. And I've actually gone through the process, gone through the proposal process, and admittedly, they said, we need to rethink this. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, and what I'm finding is that there is just so much information that I am reconsidering how I structure the book. So it's going to have to be part one, part two, part three, because the nature of architecture is quite a few pieces. Yeah. So um, I'm really looking forward to continuing this journey with them. And the book will be coming quicker because I'll have more time. Oh, that's great. That's exciting. Okay, good. Okay. Well, yes. we look forward to that. Where can we find you? Are, do you do social media? Is, do you have a website? Like where can yes. we send people to support you? Yeah. So I am on a website. It's called humandesigntheory.com. And the website is under construction right now. Okay. Um, if you go there now, you'll see my contact information. Perfect. Okay. But it, you will see things evolve here a little quicker now that some people have gotten their get out of jail car free. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, we hope to get you back to Serenby soon. If not, we may have to take I'm a little trip forward to, to Virginia because, you know, our very good friend, Tim Beatley, is at UVA. So we all need to have a little yes. biophilic cape party. Yes. Or if you ever yes. come to New York City, Tawanda, you know where to find me. Okay. I'm on that. I'm on that. So anytime you want to, you just call me. I promise you I'll be there. Well, thank you for all your time today. It was absolute joy. Yeah. It thank was a you. pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thank you, ladies, for being such wonderful proponents for this wonderful, wonderful, what do we call it? We call it revolution. A, a revolution movement. or a movement? Revolution. We call it a movement. movement no, we called it movement. That's what it was. Movement. movement. Mm -hmm. It was movement. Yes. You're part of yes. it now. Yes. Hooray. Oh my gosh, Monica. I love Tawanda so much. I know. We need to figure out how we can all hang out more. Maybe we have to meet in the middle of Virginia. <laughs> Okay. I'm so in. All right. So right off the bat, I was really struck by the idea that architecture students need to understand basic biology. That feels so intuitive once Tawanda said it, but it is definitely not something I would have thought about. Yeah, I really agree with that. It gets back to this concept we've explored previously about thinking about our built environment more in terms of a habitat, where these elements like diffuse lighting and natural materials become standard practices for basic human well-being and not an added bonus. I also love that Tawanda is such a straight shooter. She's advocating for biophilic design at a large scale, but she's also about using science and data to back that up because she realizes we'll never achieve the kind of scale we want if we don't find a way to break through to people who otherwise only think about the bottom line. 
Yeah. And even just her example of the dentist's office, I don't know many people who particularly enjoy a trip to the dentist, but I imagine (laughs) how much more relaxed you'd feel if you walked into the waiting room and there was some kind of water feature or a really relaxing color palette with natural light, or maybe a faint minty diffused scent or such. To Tawanda's point, I think we can get so used to the status quo that we don't even consider what a better alternative might look like. Going off that example, something like that might cost a bit more to build, but I would be running to that dentist's office for sure. So we highly encourage you to visit Tawanda's website. It's about ready to be built out. It's called Human Design Theory. We're going to link it in our show notes and we'll do a social push once it goes live. Definitely. Okay, Monica, talk to you later. Bye, Jen. Thanks so much for listening. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Give us a five-star rating and please leave us a review. It really goes such a long way towards helping us reach a wider audience and sharing these amazing interviews and solutions with the world. Absolutely. So thanks so much for following and reviewing the podcast. And we'll be back with another amazing interview in two weeks. You're now a part of the Biophilic Movement.